All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Ronica. Uh, we're happy to have you on this webinar series. Um, you know, whenever we talk about the implications of some of this bin shop research that you're doing, um, you know, the, the, one of the biggest areas in epigenetic research is in diet nutrition. And so we're so excited to have you on as, as uh, the sort of the first PhD to appear. Um, before we get started, can you just give everyone a little bit of background into uh, some of the work you've been doing and, and how you got into this uh, field of epigenetics? Thanks for having me, uh, Ryan. Um, I uh, first got in the, into the field of epigenetics during my PhD. Uh, it was a very like lucky time. So I started my PhD in 2007 and uh, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, medicine in 2006 was awarded for the discovery of RNA interference which is one of the many epigenetic mechanisms regulating uh, our physiology. And, um, and so I, I was excited. I wanted to, to get into the field. And uh, I had the opportunity to, um, to uh, start working with a, a terrific uh, model uh, organism, Tetahamena thermophila. Uh, which, uh, you know, the, 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 the first uh, epigenetic discoveries were made using Tetrahamena thermophila, which is a ciliate, is a, a unicellular organism swimming uh, in, uh, in fresh water. Um, uh, probably you have, uh, you have all uh, already bumped into some Tetrahamena thermophila in your life when uh, going on a, on a pond, on a freshwater pond. Um, and so, for example, you know, um, uh, many uh, histone uh, modification enzymes have been uh, discovered in Tetrahamena thermophila and also telomerase. Uh, and then um, I did um, postdoctoral studies in Oxford. Um, working on another kind of epigenetic modification, histone modifications, uh, and uh, their link to cancer and DNA damage. And then um, at that time I was working with yeast, so I switched um, uh, East, uh, the, I, I switched model system and I, I switched the, uh, I, I was studying another kind of epigenetic modification. And then for my second postdoc, I changed again. So I started to work on uh, DNA methylation, yet another kind of epigenetic modification, and apply this to the field of nutrition in real life, real clinical settings, working on uh, the diet fit, uh, fit study by Professor Christopher Gardner, which is uh, uh, today the largest randomized clinical trial ever und uh, undertaken to compare low carb and low fat diets. I have a lot of follow up questions based on, on uh, everything you said, but to start, one of the things I want to talk about is that study. I think that as uh, a lot of clinicians are going to be watching this, uh, they might be interested just to hear a little bit more about that. Can you talk a little bit more about how that was set up and, and some of the results that you've gotten from that study? So the diet fit study um, uh, is, uh, was uh, um, a randomized clinical trial of 609 men and women that were randomized to either a low carb or a low fat diet, which they followed for one year. Now, the, uh, the, the cool uh, aspect of this study is that we um, are also collecting lots of data. So it's not only weight loss. While weight loss was the primary outcome, um, and uh, we published already the, the, the results of that primary study in 2018. So there was no difference in weight loss between the low-carb and, lo and the low-fat group. However, we collected lots of other data, microbiome, I work, worked on the epigenetics. Um, I, uh, we, we collected also genetic data and I, I'm going to um, work on another genetic project um, and the metabolome, everything. So we are now uh, saying, okay, the snapshot is that there's no difference, but then if we dive into subgroups of people based on their unique characteristics, we may be able to see differences and predict which diet 
is better for which people. For example, I just, um, uh, one of my analyses was just accepted for publication um, uh, in uh, the International Journal of Obesity. We compared men and women. And there are significant differences in weight loss just, just by looking at something so obvious like sex differences okay. and uh, why this might be the case. So again, is a, is a, is a, is a study that um, uh, the main focus of the study is precision nutrition, understanding which diet is better for which people. That's absolutely fascinating. I have some follow-up questions on that as well, but real quickly, just want to take a step back to some of your personal history. I know that you, you mentioned in, in your background, you've worked on with a lot of different organisms and a lot of different epigenetic modifications. I know that the majority of the, the, the talks that I've had on this webinar series really talk about methylation um, it's sort of as a standalone epigenetic modification. But um, obviously, you've worked with histone remodeling. I, I, have you done any work with acetylation or uh, phosphorylation? Um, and, and, and out of all those sort of uh, different epigenetic changes, uh, why is methylation, I should say, the, the one that you're, you're studying now? So DNA methylation is uh, probably um, uh, more useful, more applicable, um, uh, especially in, in studies pertaining nutrition and lifestyle intervention. Uh, first, because it's uh, quantitative. We can quantitate DNA methylation at a single nucleotide resolution. So this is very important. It's, uh, it's the most studied modification of all, um, epigenetic modification of all. And also, it accounts for the greater percentage of long-term effects. So uh, usually, histone modification are very rapid, and uh, you know that they can explain rapid changes in gene expression that we need, for example, for uh, um, uh, starting producing uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines when uh, when we get an inflammation. So rapid responses. So the methylation. Uh, I think now is uh, the, the reason why it's more useful is for these three reasons. Quanti we can quantitate it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's been studied for a long time and uh, it's best suited for measuring long-term effects. So thank you for that. I, I think that, uh, that that's definitely helpful as, as uh, I think a lot of times epigenetics, especially in the integrated community, are, are geared toward these aging epigenetics with a methylation based. And, and so it's important to have a lot of that context as the background. Um, going, going forward with even some of the diet fit studies, I know that you've reported some other sort of uh, loci specific methylation results, which might have some clinical application. Um, can you talk about those a little bit? So we still didn't publish the, the, those results. So this is uh, the luxury of, uh, of working on uh, such uh, um, a big trial where we have our hands in many projects and uh, <laughs> we, we wait, uh, it's, it's difficult to get them published. Uh, you, soon but um yes so i work on two aspects of the epigenetics one was genome wide so we look at at just differences in gene expression between the low carb and low fat uh, group um, in methylation but then as you mentioned we also looked at one particular epigenetic biomarker uh, that um, was published actually was demonstrated to um, predict type 2 diabetes uh, over uh, seven years, the risk of type, uh, developing type, type 2 diabetes over seven years in more than 10,000 people of different ethnicity. And uh, this study was published in uh, um, early 2017 in Nature. And uh, uh, the specific biomarker is uh, located in a, in, a, in a gene, ABCG1, uh, which has pleiotropic effects on uh, uh, metabolism, lipids and glucose, uh, and uh, it has been associated with the type 2 diabetes. Um, so the, uh, the interesting aspects of, of, the, of this, uh, this gene, um, this particular biomarker, is that uh, we see that it is written in pencil. So it is reversible and modifiable by diet and lifestyle. Which, uh, which means, uh, oh, and it makes sense, so which means probably we, we do uh, develop um, uh, an increased risk for type 2 diabetes with uh, an, unfavorable, an unfavorable lifestyle. Sure. And then when we switch 
to a better lifestyle, we can decrease that, uh, that risk. So um, this is exciting. Um, we are, stay tuned for, uh, for the publication. But anyway, we see that this changes with diet and it changes in the positive direction we, we, that, we will, uh, uh, that we would expect. And I think that's exciting because you can sort of see the direction of these big studies. You see these large scale studies, which are collecting a lot of important data points. And then you can narrow it down to things that uh, like this particular ABCG1 uh, that has uh, independent risk alone and then also can be as a marker that you can change, um, which, which sort of shows some of the, I think, the importance of uh, this epigenetic measurement versus some of the traditional genetics where it's harder to control and change that value. And so I think that that's a great point. I have to ask a follow-up question, as I know that, uh, you know, with a lot of the uh, people who are interested in nutrition might say, do you have any data about whether a high-carb or, uh, or a low-carb or low-fat diet is more likely to change that particular variant? <laughs> I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, talk to that, uh, also because we did just now the analysis not by diet. Um, I have an hypothesis, though. Um, uh, so in the primary study, the one published in Nature that I mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, so increased DNA methylation at these locus was associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes and was correlated with high triglycerides and low HDL, but not with cholesterol. And, uh, and so we know that, I mean, if there is one bi biomarker that's really reliable of low carb diet, of a low carb diet is that it, it decreases your triglycerides. Absolutely. This makes me think that a low carb diet is more likely to decrease the, the DNA methylation in this locus. And this is also something that I, I think in the future of the epigenetic, applying epigenetics and nutrition studies, it would be very important to create these uh, correlations between epigenetics and metabolomics because uh, uh, this is an example of how, you know, the, the nutrition field is a little a mess because it's very, very difficult to track um, what people eat. Right, but if you use, if we use an objective biomarker such as triglycerides, we know that they go down on a low carb body diet, and then we correlate that with an epigenetic mark. Then we can strengthen the scientific uh, validity of uh, of that uh, association, and also increase the predictive power because perhaps combining the metabolic biomarker and the epigenetic signature we can get higher predictive power. I think that that's uh, exciting because you really take down the, you know, from the theory of investigation all the way to application in the clinical setting. And I know that that is where, you know, so many of these integrative physicians who are watching this are going to be very, very excited. So hopefully we'll have a, uh, once you publish, we'd love to have you back on and, and talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe some sure. other things. Um, and, and so we want to maybe just go a slightly different direction now, which is, um, you know, Nutrition and aging are, you know, uh, very tightly linked, um, and uh, and also the field of epigenetics and aging are, I would say, very tightly linked. Um, we've talked a lot on some of the, the prior webinar sessions about um, sort of these aging clocks, and and we just want to ask about sort of uh, your experience with these aging clocks, um, and and have you applied any of uh, your nutrition research and to to sort of the the aging interventions? So. Um... Uh, when I started the, my postdoc here at Stanford, actually um, working on the diet fit study, uh, we played with the Hanum clock, the saliva-based uh, Hanum clock, working with three CPGs. And uh, uh, I say played with because we didn't really analyze um, all the data. We were just... Uh, comparing our biological age in the lab and uh, and uh, um, but that 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 was uh, yeah a fun experiment i was actually younger than uh, than my chronological age um, and many of my colleagues were older so that was uh, was interesting um, uh, but then uh, um, now i'm planning to uh, analyze the new biological clock, the DNA uh, Green Age by Professor Steve Orvat in our study. So Steve um, 
gave a, a wonderful lecture for my course on diet and gene expression at Stanford. Is actually this this lecture is online, available on my YouTube channel. I'm not a, a, a social media active person, but I'm I'm trying to uh, um, uh, to uh, um, share all the education uh, the, the education final videos that I produce as a byproduct of my courses on my channel so you can uh, watch that and uh, after that guest lecture we uh, i suggested why we could perhaps um, uh, analyze the dna um, uh, so methylation clock the, his new clock we still didn't uh, start that project because covid19 was delaying um, our plans uh, but uh, I hope we will uh, soon be able to do that. So that's uh, that's an exciting opportunity. I'm sure that uh, there's no shortage of exciting opportunities. And I know that uh, you, you're, you've got your hands involved in a lot of different projects. And so uh, excited for all of them and, and, and can't wait to see what you produce. Um, just to, to sort of, uh, I know that dive in a little bit further, um, even looking at things like uh, the, the ABCG1 um, loci, um, can you talk a little bit about how you differentiate um, whether or not interventions affect the epigenetics or the epigenetics affect the outcome interventions and sort of how you design these studies to try and, and, and solve that problem? It's a very difficult uh, question. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, longitudinal studies are better suited to understand the, the directionality right if something happens before and after so of course cross-sectional studies cannot uh, address any uh, any question of uh, directionality um, we do have already an hypothesis um, regarding uh, the directionality of obesity and epigenetic changes so the model is that actually gaining weight changes our epigenetic uh, epigenetic markers such as abcg1 but then in turn that change can affect our predisposition for obesity associated diseases and perhaps even for losing weight because some of these uh, epigenetic modifications are a little stiff so they are they are written in pencil but are difficult to erase and that could explain might might explain why some people that are overweight find it more difficult difficult to lose weight and so going back to your question uh, for the study design this model for example was uh, uh, was developed um, again uh, in the context of the study of the nature study uh, i mentioned and they did uh, uh, a mendelian randomization analysis so they uh, also accounted for a, a genetic variant associated with the dna mutation profile and then they had a longitudinal uh, data sets so of uh, you know uh, the the two visits separated by seven years so in this way these are all tools that can allow us to make uh, more yeah, um, solid uh, models i think that um now that sort of uh, testing through to companies like ours are becoming more available to physicians everywhere uh and they want to do some analysis on their patients i think that those are important considerations in terms of knowing what data to get and and really how to collect it over time and so uh, i appreciate you talking a little bit about that uh in case that people do want to do this, sort of their own small scale studies and, and even personalized interventions to see how they're they're reacting even in in their own body um, and so I appreciate that context as well. Um, you know, I, just sort of wrapping up, I, I want to just get on a, on a large scale level. How, I, right now, I think uh, there are a lot of companies out there that sort of do functional genomics and make recommendations for diet and nutrition based on underlying genetic predispositions. How, how far away do you think we are from having an epigenetic version of that, which is actually useful? So, first of all, uh, yeah, there are already companies making a recommendation based on genetics, and I think we are, the science is not uh, solid enough. We do have uh, um, some very well-documented studies on some certain uh, genetic variants. So, this is for genetics and just um, uh, that uh, regard that um, involve specifically macronutrient, uh, micronutrient metabolism uh, and omega-3s. Uh, but anyway, also the genetic field, I think, is not, is not ready. And the reason is that most of those predictions are based on 
cross-sectional studies with poor dietary intake data, and also only on a small subset of genes. You, uh, the complex traits like re a response to diet uh, or even our risk for, for uh, chronic disease are complex traits, and uh, they can be explained by the interaction of hundreds of thousands of genes with many environmental factors. So. Also, those reports, I think, are uh, a little, uh, um, yes, uh, they, they, they should be interpreted with caution. Now, the same is with the epigenetics. So I think we, already, we also have, already have some low-hanging fruits that we can use now. And I use it in my course on dietary expression. So I teach, for example, that there are some nutrients that I call epinutrients which have been already shown to be beneficial for our health through epigenetic mechanisms. And the list of epinutrients is, uh, is growing every day because then scientists test and find out that actually many nutrients are, are doing that. And some of these nutrients are specifically helpful for some condi conditions. For example, uh, sulforaphane is a very famous epinutrient and uh, it has been shown to uh, upregulate, turn on uh, detox reactions and uh, also ameliorate the, the symptoms of, uh, of uh, um, highly uh, polluted, uh, high pollution. And uh, um, this is one example. The other example are um, uh, dietary patterns that, that have been already associated with some uh, gene expression changes that can be beneficial for some conditions. For example, a ketogenic diet has been associated with uh, downregulation of excitatory pathways in the brain and uh, upregulation of inhibitory pathways in the brain. And this might explain why a ketogenic diet has been a standard therapy for uh, you know, uh, the refractory epilepsy for many years. Sure. And then the third uh, avenue are biomarkers, that the, like the ABCG1 that we are testing. So we already have these three lines of possible applications that are going on. And I call this field uh, in my course, Epi Wellness, is a, a new paradigm of health where we, we really understand that actually lifestyle is information, is biological information. Thanks to epigenetics, we used to think that, you know, life, biology is one thing and lifestyle is another. And, but now we see that lifestyle actually gets encoded in our biology through epigenetics. Then there are uh, future avenues for uh, the application of uh, epigenetics in personalized nutrition. I think one promising uh, uh, approach is uh, trying to do what we are already doing with the genetics. So we are developing polygenic risk scores that pull together many hundred th thousand genetic variants to increase the prediction power of uh, of uh, um, uh, complex traits. And uh, um, uh, doing that with uh, an epigenome-wide epigeno score, uh, which gives a weight to each epigenetic changes based on the, their effect size in uh, epigenome-wide association studies and significance, could really, really, really improve the, um, the field. I'm working on uh, um, polygenic uh, scores for genetics for the diet feed study with the Professor Jose Ordovas at Tufts. And we see the promise in genetics. So I, I really anticipate that this could innovate the, also the field of, of, of uh, epigenetics too. And then one other exciting opportunity, I think um, you are just scratching the surface of that, is that we finally have the, um, uh, uh, the, the sequence. We know where the imprinted genes in, uh, in the human genome are. So um, uh, uh, Randy, Professor Randy Girtle is also another guest lecturer in my course and, 
and dear friend and is so excited he shared with me this news and he thinks that this is the future of epigenetics so imprinted genes are genes that um, are imprinted are methylated um, either uh, only uh, in 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 the, uh, from the so the maternal copy or the paternal copy and why this is so important because because of this this means that we are virtually haploid for these genes so we only one copy is functioning which means if you lose if one of that the single copy is not working this is going to have a high uh, phenotypic uh, effect. So if we now narrow down on those uh, imprinted genes um, uh, that have also been shown to store the information about the nutritional environment during pregnancy, I mean, I think this is an exciting avenue. We could develop some chips where we, we just have the imprinted genes, but we first need to understand their function. So again, more research is needed, but I think it's an exciting time. And then, uh, of course, we uh, will also need to, uh, I think, as I mentioned, correlate the epi epi uh, epigenomic changes with other Sure. multi-omics changes, uh, metabolome, and then uh, integrate this information with genetics. And, uh, and also, finally, I think we need to a better tracking, to develop a, a, a system to better track the exposome, all the factors we are exposed to, and of course, the dietary uh, intervention. And that's why some objective markers uh, of, uh, of dietary intake will be very helpful. I think that that is uh, a couple great points there. I think that it has a lot of implications to, to the interventions, whether it be drug development or dietary interventions. And I love that word, the exposome. I hadn't heard that before, but uh, love, love that uh, as, a, as a phrase. And, and I think that it's important to also add a lot of that context you know, we always talk about 60% of the methylome being essentially changeable and 40% being heritable. Um, and, and I think that uh, it's important to have context of what those 40% are and how they affect the body. Um, and so we're so excited to hear a lot of that, that uh, data come out as well. Um, and so one, one thing I want to just offer to everyone who's listening is maybe a little bit more information on where they might be able to hear you speak um, a little bit more. Do you have a, a website that they can go to? I do have a website, uh, draronica.com. I'm using that mainly for uh, um, uh, posting the links to my courses at Stanford now, uh, and people can reach out there. I've also um, an Instagram and Facebook page, Happy Wellness. And, um, and the YouTube channel. Um, I'm not very active, so it's a good idea actually to sub subscribe, but I do have uh, some uh, bigger plans for uh, the uh, fall quarter. So I decided that since I, I always receive lots of questions uh, from my students every quarter about epigenetics, I'm going to record a Q&A uh, and post it on, on my YouTube channel so that I can share the, the questions and the answers from my um, course with the, with the larger um, uh, the audience. And I can say from experience, if anyone has an interest in some of the conversations we've had to date, uh, that is a great YouTube channel and I would highly recommend it. Um, and, and just to wrap up with one final question, I, I, uh, one of the biggest, I should say, interventions in the anti-aging space right now is a nutritional intervention in terms of fasting mimicking diets or fasting diets. Um, have you done any work in that? And, and can you summarize it if you have? I teach a course on fast mimicking diets and ketogenic diets. Uh, I didn't uh, personally analyze epigenetic changes in, the, in that context, uh, but of course, in, uh, um, because I teach, uh, I teach that, I, I'm very familiar with the, with the literature and it will be difficult to pack this in a, in a few minutes. But as your audience may know, uh, fast mimicking diets are diets that mimic the, um, the biological effects of fasting um, by either playing when uh, with the when we eat, so restricting the eating window, window, or what we eat. If we restrict carbohydrates to a certain levels, we produce ketones, and so we um, uh, we uh, we also uh, the, the is 
mi are mimicking the, effect of, the effects of fasting, or also how much we eat. Of course, if we, if we do a very strict calorie restriction, we also um, mimic the effects of fasting. Now, uh, there are common features of fast mimicking diets, the production of ketone bodies, uh, is actually a common feature, but then the extent um, to which these keto bodies are produced differ between uh, 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 intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, and uh, calorie restrictions, um, uh, and uh, also the modality, uh, of course. And uh, uh, but also there are uh, keto the production of keto bodies, bodies is only one of the many hallmarks of. Uh, fast mimicking diets. Um, uh, there is uh, there are autophagy, of course, is a, and uh, mTOR signaling, and all these diets differ. And, uh, and ultimately, they have different, different effects on our physiology. For example, you know, the intermittent production of ketones uh, doesn't seem to be uh, like uh, we do on, a, on a intermittent fasting, for example, doesn't seem to be enough to uh, trigger long-term adaptations in mitochondrial adaptations that are uh, defined as like keto adaptations uh, and uh, that seem to require a constant uh, state of uh, ketosis, even mild ketosis. But anyway, all these, these are tools in the box of nutrition. The point of my course is to teach that we can combine them. And even, you know, if we, if we study them in an, in an isolated way, uh, uh, you know, that the effects may be different if we, com if we combine them. For example, just an, an example, athletes. Athletes, uh, produce ketones naturally after training. If they combine that with intermittent fasting or a ketogenic diet, they may have actually, they may experience a synergistic effect that is not reported in the literature. And that's why I think one other avenue for the future of epigenetics and the personalized nutrition are N of one studies because we are all different from each other. And, uh, you know, these studies uh, are, are, are great and are useful, but they should only be used as tools for us, for, uh, for uh, the new generation of patients that are, that are proactive and uh, wishing to self-experiment using the knowledge to find their own truth love that and, and couldn't have wrapped it up better myself. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ronica, for hopping on. I know that we would love to have you back as you continue to publish and, and find out more insights um, into this really exciting field. And so thanks so much again for your time and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you. Thank you.